And, but we're reading through in The Great Adventure, reading through the Bible in three years. And so this week's reading was Esther chapter 3 through chapters 9. And you can pick up one of these reading guides. You know, most, uh, most Christians have never read through the whole Bible, but in a very uh, moderate pace, anybody can handle it. And you can also spend time meditating on it. Uh, there's a portion as we're reading through uh, the Old Testament or the New Testament and then Psalms and Proverbs. So you can check that out. But since that's our, our reading, uh, this week's message comes from Esther chapter 6. So if you have a, have a Bible, you'll want to open to Esther chapter 6. As you look at our message, God has a plan, you can trust Him. Now at different times in our life, we really believe that statement, God has a plan for your life, He has a purpose, He's working out that plan, and you can trust Him. But when everything seems to be going wrong and you really don't see God's plan and purposes and understanding, you can begin to question that. The book of Esther is about a story when the children of Israel have been, because of the Lord's discipline, they were exiled out of the land of Israel, and the majority of them were, un, uh, all of them, I guess, at this season, are under the authority of the Persian Empire. And because of this, uh, God works his plan to put a guy by the Morde name of Mordecai and his relative Esther kind of undercover as believers of God's people. And God ultimately, through this incredible beauty contest, Esther ends up being at the right hand or the queen of the king, uh, King Ahasuerus. But during this time, you can see why God has put these pieces of the puzzle in place because there's this wicked Haman guy. He's the villain of the story. He rises up and he hates Mordecai and therefore he wants to kill and execute Mordecai, but he's not content with that. He is so enraged by Mordecai. He wants to kill all of Mordecai's people. He wants to create a genocide of Jewish people, and he wants to kill, historians tell us at this time, there was probably 15 million Jews in the 127 provinces of the king of Persia. So imagine your hatred for one man turning into a desire to kill 15 million people. It's kind of, it shouldn't be that far stretched in your imagination because Adolf Hitler spotted the Jews, hated their guts, and during that time in 1939, there was about 17 million Jews in the world, and he killed 6 million so that there was only 11 million afterwards. But this guy's an Old Testament Adolf Hitler. His name's Haman. Have you ever seen, maybe at work or in a family or in somebody's relationship or a bully at school, have you ever watch the rise of somebody that is evil and they seem to be getting away with murder? Have you ever watched that? And have you wondered what God is doing about it? David said he observed this in Psalm 37, verse 35 through 37. This is what David said. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found." Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. David said, I've seen in my lifetime the rise of evil men. But they rise and their period is very short. They get cut off and they get moved out of the way. But the righteous man, he's continuing to walk in peace. This is a supernatural story, a true story. As a matter of fact, the Jews celebrate, they just celebrated last month, the Feast of Purim. Because Haman cast lots, which in their language was pur, and so purum is the celebration of uh, casting of lots when he chose a day in the last month of the year to kill all the Jews. So every year in Israel, last month it was March 23rd and 24th, it's like their version of Halloween. Everybody plays a part. So who would all the little girls want to be? They'd all want to be Queen Esther. Who would all, and then there's others that want to be King Ahasuerus. People that want to be the hero, they are Mordecai. And then if you want to be a nefarious villain, you're Haman. And so they have a big celebration in Israel every year to celebrate this thing that happened 25 years ago. Just to establish for you, these are not ancient stories. They are connected to the here and now. And the God that took care of and had a plan for Israel to protect them, you can trust him. And maybe your world feels like it's falling apart, but you can trust God. He has a plan for you. Let's look at it as we begin in chapter 6, and we read the first five verses. It says, That night the king could not sleep, 
So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servants said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. Chapter 6 in this 10-chapter book is the hinge on which the door of God's plans and revelation and protection opens to save and deliver Mordecai, Esther, and all the Jewish people, and that door swings, and as it opens to protect them, it closes in judgment on a man by the name of Haman. Now, in these first five verses, I want to share with you first these three outlines, basically three thoughts for the outline for this passage of Scripture. Number one the sovereignty of God, number two, the humbling of God, and number three, the harvest of God. Check out this sovereignty of God. There are five thoughts in the first five verses that tell you that God is on the throne. Now realize everything had to perfectly happen in the method and the timing to bring these things together. Humans, human responsibility, men are making choices, but God is orchestrating. That's why we call it the sovereignty of God. Men are still responsible. Women are still responsible to make the decisions of their life. And number one, we see the sovereignty of God on this night that king can't sleep. You ever have a sleepless night? Sometimes I can't sleep when I go to bed. So, you know, you're tossing and turning. And if I can't sleep, I usually turn on the light and just start reading my Bible. And uh, I, I, I can't go to sleep. And sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night. You ever wake up in the middle of the night? It's 2 in the morning. You're like, what in the world am I doing awake? The older you get, the more you problems you have with this, right? And then you ever wake up at, at some absurd hour? Okay, it's 3.30. You, you're wide awake. You're like, it's too early to get up. I don't want to get up. Well, the king wakes up early in the morning, and so, number one, he, the king has a sleepless night, and this is God's sovereignty. All through the scriptures, when the Lord needs to reach the ultimate authority of a nation, he usually deals with them in their bedroom and on their bed. You remember the dream of Pharaoh? The dream of Nebuchadnezzar? God works in a way to reach their lives. And in this sleepless night, number one, we see the sovereignty of God that he somehow nudges the king, awakes him, so he can't sleep. But secondly, the sovereignty of God, what what is your remedy? If you want to put yourself back to sleep, what is your remedy? Well, the king's remedy was to grab the chronicles. Look at it. It says, so one, in verse one, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. The chronicles of the kings of Persia was the daily activity. It was basically a daily blow-by-blow uh, uh, event calendar of what happened every single day. And talk about blah, 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 blah. You want to be bored stiff, get a half-asleep servant reading to you a monotonous line. Wah, 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 wah. That'll put anybody to sleep. And so the sovereignty of God, number two, was his choice of his sleep remedy was, why don't you read me those really boring chronicles of the daily activity, and that'll knock me out like nobody's business. But this was the sovereignty of God. Thirdly, we see the sovereignty of God because the servant that has to grab the chronicles, we are told this by historians that study the Persian Empire, they were notorious record keepers. So they had very good records and chronicles of all of these things. And so... Historically, this event of Mordecai revealing a murder or assassination plot on the king happened five years before this, so five years. So if they had one volume or one scroll per year, which would probably, I mean, because of ancient paper and and all those things, they probably had multiples for just each year. But imagine randomly on a huge bookshelf of all the chronicles of the daily business of a king, that servant, half asleep, just goes over there and randomly, from his perspective, grabs this book and pulls it off the shelf. It's a five-year-old edition. The sovereignty of God has the king awake. The sovereignty of God, his desire is to remedy his sleeplessness by the chronicles of the kings. And then this servant randomly grabs, from human's perspective, but the divine sovereignty of God, grabs the chronicles so that when he, even if it's, say it's a 
Say it's three months' worth of activity, and he flops it open to the specific page that records Mordecai's rescue of the king. You see, God is a big God. He has this incredible divine attribute called foreknowledge. Do you know that God knows what tomorrow holds for you? He knows what next week holds? The Bible says that all of your days already are written in a book. Do you know from God's perspective, your life's already, he, he knows every detail of it. Now, you can trust a God like that because he knows everything, right? And so he has a plan for your life. He is sovereign. He's in charge. He sees Esther. He sees Mordecai. He sees Haman and his wickedness trying to kill all those people. Well, then we see the timing of God that comes together. If those three things are powerful, check it out. In verse 3, it says, Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. Now think about it. Mordecai is a Jewish man that hangs out at the king's gate, and one day he overhears a conspiracy of assassination to kill the king from two doorkeepers. These guys, maybe they're whispering on their breath, yeah, we're going to kill Ahasuerus next week, Wednesday night, whenever his guards are all away, or it's the, he's the least guard, we're going to go kill him. So Big Thana and Teresh are going to kill him. Mordecai overhears this assassination plot. He tells Esther because that's his relative. Esther tells the king. The king has the FBI go investigate it, and it's all true. So those guys are dead. King kills them. So you would think, I mean, just think about it. If it's been five years, the king says, as he's hearing this, he said, hey, I remember that. Five years ago, what did we do for him? Now, if you reveal the assassination plot of a king that is overruling 127 provinces, don't you get the Citizen of the Year medal? Right? Don't you have some ceremony where you get to stand and say, hey, look what, look what he, he has done for me by revealing this assassination plot. But realize this, in the sovereignty of God, this fourth thought is that the reward was delayed with a divine purpose. Have you ever done well? Maybe you're doing well at work, and it's time for your quarterly review or your half-year review, and you didn't get the raise you expected? You didn't get the promotion you expected? Have you ever been overlooked? H have you ever been, you know, working your heart out at practice, and you're the sixth man on a basketball team, and, and you just know, I mean, you've killed it this week. You're, you, you've made it clear to the coach and all the players that you deserve to be on the fifth player? instead of the bench, and had the coach overlook you? Every single person usually knows what it feels like to be overlooked. And you either just accept it and surrender that to God, like, oh, God, you got a plan. You see, God has a plan for you, and it's, not, it's no mistake the delays of the reward for you. It's no mistake. God delays things for a purpose. Think of Joseph. Here in this story, he, it's been five years, and now he's going to get the reward because the timing's perfect according to God's plan. You remember Joseph? He's in jail, and the baker and the butler get thrown into jail in the book of Genesis. And they were sad one morning, and Joseph, he goes, hey, you guys are sad. What's up? They said, oh, we both had dreams. We don't know what they mean. And Joseph, God gave Joseph a gift to interpret dreams. He said, well, God gives the interpretation. Tell me what the dreams are. And so the butler told him his dream. He goes, hey, three days, you're going to be right at, at the right hand of the king. And the butler was pretty excited, like, hey, right on. And then the baker told him his dream. He said, you're going to be dead in three days. Well, you know, bad news, good news. It all goes together. So, but Joseph said this. He said this to the butler. Now, when you're back at the right hand of the king, tell him about me. I'm a Jewish guy. I'm, the, 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 these are trumped up charges. I didn't do this. Tell the king. Tell Pharaoh. And I think Joseph, man, he just thought, God is so good. He, he brought the butler here. The butler's going to be next to the king in three days, and he's going to get me out of this joint. He probably just started packing. I'm getting out of jail. Two years goes by. What a drag. Two years. Delayed reward. Because two years later, who has a dream? Pharaoh has a dream. He has two dreams about the famine or the blessing and the famine that's coming. And when he told the butler the dream, he goes, ah, now I remember my sin. There's this Jewish kid, and he interpreted our dreams and you get him, he's going to tell you what these dreams mean. And so Joseph goes from being in jail to becoming the prime minister in one day. You see, God has a plan. God has a plan. And Joseph trusted God's plan. He didn't get bitter because he was overlooked. Mordecai doesn't get bitter because he's overlooked. But the fourth thing is we see now the delayed reward. God had a purpose to have him overlooked so that when the time was right, God can see the future, and he planned this out. 
Fifthly, we see the Haman's eager arrival. In verse 4, it says, So the king said, Who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Now, can you get any better timing than this? The king just read about Mordecai revealing an assassination plot and wants to honor him above all people. And Haman showed up early. I mean, it's oh, dark 30. He gets there early in the morning. He's, in the, he's the only one in the king's outer court because he's going to be first in line to have his request. He built a gallows the day before to hang Mordecai on. Do you think God comes through in the last minute? He comes through in the last minute. And so they said, Haman's here. He's uh, the early bird. I'm here to request that I can hang Mordecai on the gallows. And the king wants to ask him, how can we reward Mordecai? Now, does God have a sense of humor or what? Because check this out. Not only is there the sovereignty of God, but there's the humbling of God. Do you know that God knows how to humble proud people? Do you know that? Have you experienced it yourself? Has God ever brought you through a time of humbling where you just bowed your knees and said, yes, Jesus, your Lord? Check out what happens in verse 6 through 12. So Haman came in, and the king asked him, What shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Check this out. Now Haman thought in his heart, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? You see, Haman's one of those guys that goes through life thinking the sun rises and sets on his life. He is filled with pride. He is the self-centered jerk. And when he, the king asked him this, he thought, You know, who in the world would the king want to honor? honor more than moi. Have you ever met somebody that they just go through life just filled with themselves? They love to talk about themselves, and when they're done talking about themselves, hey, I'm done talking about myself. Would you talk about me for a little while? (laughs) Have you ever met somebody that goes through life with such a prideful condescension towards everybody else in life? Have you ever met somebody that goes through life so self-centered they destroy every relationship they're in all the way through their life? That's Haman. You see, he looks at this request of the king, and he, he has no doubt whatsoever it's about him. Now, if, I think he's dreamed of this moment his whole life. Oh, if the king would honor me, and he had it rehearsed. Man, this just spills out of him like he's been th- taking notes for like five years. Look what he says in verse 7. And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Now that's quite a thing, right? You just come up with that out of nowhere? I want to wear the king's robe, I want to ride the king's horse, and I want the king's highest servant to take me through the middle of town saying, this is what happens to the man that the king wants to honor, because he's thinking it's all about him. Now get God's sense of humor in verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew. He's coming there to have him killed. Imagine the reversal that his greatest enemy, the biggest thorn in his side, is now going to get the honor that he wanted for himself. You can't help but laugh. God has a sense of humor. It says here in verse 11, So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed him Mordecai, and led on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And afterward Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. God knows how to humble us, doesn't he? He knows how to humble us. And he knew how to humble Mordecai or excuse me, Haman, as he was coming to have Mordecai killed. Can you picture, if this is your greatest enemy, I don't know if you're really good people, you've probably really never hated somebody's guts, but I've hated some people's guts. You ever been sideways with someone where you're grow- growing up, where they're the bully or they're this person that has just been this thorn in your side, and then to see them honored just makes you want to vomit? Imagine Haman. 
in this moment when the king says, now go do what you said. Go get my robe, go get my horse, and you're the man that's going to lead Mordecai through the streets saying, this is what the king does for the man that he wants to honor. Or maybe this is what the king wants to do for the king. You know? <laughs> maybe his heart really wasn't into it. You know what I mean? Maybe he wasn't that exuberant about that. But the reversal, how God turns those things around. I want to encourage us, all of us, that as we see this issue of pride in Haman's life, it behooves us, it's beneficial for us to do a little inventory of our own soul about the pride of our hearts. Pride ruins everything. Pride ruins marriages. It ruins parent-child relationships. It ruins work relationships. It ruins church relationships. It ruins relationships on a team. You ever watch a team that has all this talent, but because of their pride, they don't know how to work together and humble themselves as a team, and they begin to tear the team apart because of their own arrogance and their own pride? You see, you and I are either walking in humility, and that is, to be humble means that you take a lower view of yourself Because pride wants to exalt you above everybody. But when you take a lower view, you prefer others before yourself. And so it's really a transformation that takes place in your soul when you acknowledge this. Look at a couple of passages that really encourage humility rather than pride. It says in Proverbs 18, 12, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but before honor is humility. Before a disaster comes, pride is usually preceding it. But before we're honored, humility precedes it. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If we humble ourselves, God gives us grace, he gives us, he, he ministers to us, to have the right heart and the right perspective and the right attitude. But God hates pride and he resists it. He's in opposition to pride. How many of us need the God of the universe in opposition to you? Is not life difficult enough? Do you need the God of the universe in, I'm gonna oppose you? No, I'd rather humble myself and say, I want some grace. (laughs) I need your help, God. I, I don't want you in opposition to me. It's a crazy thing, but pride is the only disease that makes other people sick. Isn't it? When you see somebody filled with pride, it just makes you sick to your stomach. Because people that, it's probably the most blinding sin because we we can't see it in ourselves. We can't see it in ourselves. Haman probably couldn't see it. He he would probably never admit to being a, a prideful person. And yet, we see that God has a way of humbling So number one, God has a sovereign plan and purpose that he can orchestrate the events of your life, my life, Mordecai's life, Esther's life, the Jewish people's lives, our family's lives. And even though in the dark times we can't see how God is working, down the road we're going to see how God works it all out. And that's the most difficult thing about waiting for God's plan to unfold. Well, then there's the harvest, the third thought in this passage. There's a harvest, and that is the harvest of sowing and reaping. Because you see, Esther and Mordecai and the Jewish people are humbling themselves in this season of their life. God is taking their cause and bringing about the help that they need. But Haman is sowing in self-centeredness and pride and murder and vengeance and all the things that are inside of him. So payday now comes. In verse 13 and 14, it says, When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Now, for those who have not been following the reading with us, you might be a little lost, but let me just briefly tell you what's up. You see, in chapter 5, Esther, after fasting for three days, asked the king to come to a banquet where she was going to reveal to him what her request was. But we don't know why she, whether she panics or she just says, oh, I don't have the courage. Would you come back tomorrow for another banquet and then I'll put my request before you. And so chapter six is between chapter five and chapter seven and it's the hinge on which everything turns. And so at the end of this chapter, the eunuchs come and say, second banquet, Haman come. And this is the one in chapter seven where Esther's gonna say, this guy is the Adolf Hitler of our day. 
This guy's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill Mordecai. He's trying to kill all the Jewish people. And because of that, this is, his, this is Haman's last summer, summer, last supper. And Haman's going to be dead. Even his wife, even his friends, even his wise counselors, it says here, his wife Zeresh, his friends, and his, his wise men say, you know what? You're toast. You have sowed to the wind, and you're going to reap the whirlwind. You have sowed in your selfishness. You've sowed in your arrogance, and you're going to reap that. Do you know that every single person in this room is going through life sowing seeds? We're either sowing seeds of uh, we're receiving Christ, we're reading the Word, we're in prayer, we're in fellowship, we're beginning to humble ourselves in our new walk with God, and God's beginning to change our life. And those are seeds that there's going to be a harvest, and it's good things. The Bible says that there's going to be a, a fruitful harvest. But other people are going through life and we're sowing our anger, we're sowing our jealousy, we're sowing our drunkenness, we're sowing our sin, we're sowing our pride, we're sowing our arrogance. And this also is going to have a crop. It's gonna, there's going to be a harvest for these things. There's going to be a payday for that. And that's what Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for what a man sows, that he will also reap. And Haman has sowed and now it is harvest time. Somebody is jokingly said that people want to sow their wild oats and then pray for crop failure, <laughs> that they never grow. You know, and I want to do all of this sin and then, oh, with no consequences. I want to drink like a fish and have no liver damage. <laughs> you know, I want to do all these drugs and I want to have all my brain cells. I want to be unfaithful to my spouse and still have my family. I want to, you know, I mean, just... You want to live however you want to live, and you think that there's no consequences. You think that the seeds that you're sowing, that there's not going to be a harvest. There is a harvest. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever we're sowing, that we're going to reap. So Haman now is going to reap what he experienced. But what's Mordecai experience? He experiences God's plan, God's protection, God's intervention. It says in Proverbs 11.8, the righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. Isn't that a great proverb? God delivers the righteous from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. You and I constantly need to be reminded or encouraged that God is for us. If you believe in Jesus and you're his servant, he has a plan, he has a purpose, he wants to protect, he wants to work in your life. You see, it says in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, who can be against you? I love Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. The Lord says when people try to attack us, God takes it very personal because if you're a child of God, you're the apple of his eye. When Saul of Tarsus was persecuting Christians and Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and threw a bright light, uh, Saul of Tarsus fell down. The Lord said, you're persecuting me, Saul. He didn't say you're persecuting all my people. No, he said, you're persecuting me. When you mess with my people, Jesus said, you're messing with me. And so he knocked him down on the road to get his attention, to talk to him about his pride and his arrogance and his hatefulness. And Saul humbled himself and became Paul the Apostle, the great servant of the Lord. But through all of this, realize it's Esther's not the hero of the story. Mordecai is not the hero of the story. Every wonderful story in the Bible, God's the hero. God's the hero because he's the one that's working. Now, he uses people, and, he, and, and they're involved in the process, but they simply, by faith, believe that God had a plan and that you could trust him. Do you believe that, sincerely, do you believe that God has a plan for your life and that you can trust him with it? Or have you begun to falter into unbelief, like, oh, I don't know if God really cares. I don't know if he's involved because, you see, this is the important thing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God wants you to trust that he has a plan and that he's going to work it out because this is the way it works. In Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called to those who are called according to his purpose. God has used all of these circumstances of a wicked Haman and God has turned it all around to use it for good. But if you looked at any one of these circumstances, you might be overwhelmed. You see, the ingredients of your life are not singular. When you look at one difficulty that you're having and you isolate it and you say, look at this trouble, how can God work that together for good? Well, it's never one isolated event. God's working in this and he's working in this and he's working in their life and he's working over here and he's working here and God's working this recipe to work it out so that he's gonna do something beautiful. You see, through this, Haman got a law passed to kill all the Jews. So if they would have only looked at that, they said, here's the decree, 
Esther's going to die, Mordecai is going to die, 15 million Jews are going to die. But God takes this wicked man's intentions, God turns them all around, God, God brings judgment to Haman, he dies, Mordecai is going to get his house, he's going to get his position as prime minister, and the fame of God's people goes through the empire because God turned it all around. You see, God constantly does that. Joseph's brothers hated his guts, sold him into slavery, and he ended up in prison ultimately. And if Joseph would have looked at the hatred of his brothers or the false accusations of Potiphar's wife that said he tried to rape her or, or being forgotten about the butler, if he would have looked at any one of those isolated events, he said, life stinks. But if you look at God brought all those things about in the recipe of his life to produce something beautiful, he was going to be at the right hand of Pharaoh. Oftentimes, the darkest times, God is working together for a more beautiful purpose than you even know. It would be like if I, if I offer you a piece of cake, if you're a cake lover like me, you're going to take it, right? Because I love cake. But if you offered me a cup full of flour, I don't think I'm going to like it. You can keep your cup of flour to yourself, right? But that's isolating one ingredient and in something that's awful wonderful to me, a cake, Right? But when you put all the ingredients together, you put the eggs in there, you put enough sugar in there, you put the butter in there. You got to put all the stuff and you cover the thing with icing. Now you offer, I'm into that. You see, our life is like that. You might be in your life right now where you've isolated some event and you are bitter and mad at God because he allowed X, Y, and Z to happen to you. But do you know that if you trust him that he has a plan and you walk by faith trusting that plan, do you know that God can work those things together for good? He can bring some beautiful things out of that. I have had people tell me, they'll tell me their, their disastrous life story, and then they'll tell me with this huge, joyful smile, if it hadn't been for all of this, I would have never come to know Jesus. You see, he worked it all together for good, man. I've had people tell me, you know, I destroyed my first two marriages with my self-centered arrogance, but then I came to Christ, and now this third marriage, man, because of all of that disaster, I... I know how to make this one work. I know how to make this one work. You see, our life is not one isolated events, event. It is a series of our decisions and other people's decisions. But when we trust God that he has a plan, he has a purpose, and we can trust him, we watch the beautiful work that he's going to do. We look and see what he has for us. Could anything demonstrate this more then God sending his only begotten son into the world to die for the sins of the world. And here he sends his perfect sinless son. And what does man do to him? He nails him to a cross. Kills him. Puts him in a tomb. And everybody, if they just looked at that, they say, oh, we're toast. We thought he was going to save us. We thought he was the redeemer. But God took the brutality and the ugliness of humanity's response to his son and he turned that around and he used the death on the cross to pay the price for our sins and the, the tomb, him conquering death, the two great things that all humans need and that is the, the victory over your life of sin and the victory over the fear of death. And Jesus did that both through the most ugly, dark experiences that humanity has ever seen that the ugliness of sinful man crucified the sinless Son of God. And God said, okay, that's the way you want to do it. My plan is to turn that around and use that as the source of salvation. That's my plan from beginning to end. And people didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't know that that was God's plan from the beginning. You see, God has a, a plan, he has a purpose, and you can trust him. Jesus offers us, and the most famous verse of all the New Testament is John 3.16. It's put up everywhere, but oftentimes people don't read verses 16, 17, and 18. I'd like to do that as we turn our hearts towards the end of our service. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, God gave His Son as a sacrifice for our sins, and if you believe in His Son, you're going to have everlasting life. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn people. You didn't, I hope you didn't come to church to feel condemned. God came to, He wants to save you. But you know, if you reject the only offer that God has for you, and that is the gift of His Son, 
you stand condemned. You're just condemned in your indecisiveness. You're condemned in your own lack of wanting to surrender your life to Christ. And you say, hey, you know, I, ha- I meet people all the time, and they'll say, hey, you know, Pastor, I'm not really, I'm not really for Jesus. I'm not against Him. I'm just kind of like Switzerland. I'm in spiritual neutral. And I say, you don't get it, do you? What do you mean you don't get it? To be undecided is to be decided. You have decided to be against Him. No, I'm not, I'm not really against him. I'm not really for him. I'm, there's no middle ground. Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me. There's no neutral place. And God's love for humanity is, is so overwhelming. He tells us how much he loves us. In 1 Timothy 2.4, he says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Peter 3.9, he says, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then he says in Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? God has no desire to see people die in their sins. That's why he sent his son Jesus. But then he gives you the choice. He says, you want to believe in my son? You want to walk in fellowship with his son? You want to surrender your life? You want to turn from your life of sin and make Jesus the Lord of your life? That choice is yours. That's yours. 